Hi, this is Dr. Tim Green, and I'm here with Dr. John Cowan, who is a Senior Research Associate in the Division of Outreach, Engagement, and Regional Development at Northern Illinois University. Welcome, John. Hi, Tim. Nice to be here. And we're going to talk about social network analysis. That's a specialty of John's. But before we do that, I want to let John talk a little bit about his background. He's got an interesting background and how uh, he arrived at social network analysis. So, John. Tim, it's nice to be here with you today, and I appreciate the chance to talk about social network analysis. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting field and area of uh, study for me. I started my career as a first grade school teacher and um, spent about three or four years doing that. And then I moved up to fourth grade and taught fourth grade for a few years. And then um, I was at a faculty meeting where a principal announced that a truckload of computers was going to show up and wanted to know if anybody had any experience with computers. And I raised my hand and volunteered because the weekend before I had played Donkey Kong on an Apple IIe <laughs> with an older brother of mine that lived in Denver, Colorado. And so that qualified me to be the school's first technology coordinator. And I think any of us that are in education that are at my age have similar it's stories like that, that there were no job descriptions for people like us back in those days. There were no minimal requirements because nobody knew what was going on. They just The computers just started showing up and somebody had to do something with them. It's good to know you're a Donkey Kong expert. Yeah, actually, you know, leaping barrels is a great way to get started. You know, I, I, I would consider using that in interviews if it's still applied. You know, um, I'm pretty good with the big hammer, too. Very nice. Um, it, 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 in fact, it's one of the reasons I have a mustache today. <laughs> but um, so about the time I started playing around with the computers, I realized that I had a really I had really powerful technology in my hands. Um, but most importantly, I think I realized that I was working in a school in a fairly tough neighborhood. And what I realized was that almost every kind of kid was really attracted to the computer. It's almost like no matter what kind of learner they were, there was something there for them. You know, if they were audio learners, you know, they could listen to things. If they were tactile, they could move the mouse around. Um, I remember just being blown away with kids that failed at everything else, being really masterful at things like logo and things like that. And so I began to look around for a way to further my education. And this was, uh, I want to say this was 1990 or so. Um, and I found, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I found out that there was a program starting up at the University of New Mexico that was going to be a hybrid technology program. And this was 1990. And we met once a week face to face, and then we spent time doing email tag. We had an online uh, kind of a phone system on an old VMS system where the screen would break up and people could type uh, and text back and forth. Um, but the most important experience I received during that program is that we were a cohort and we met face to face part of the time and did did the rest of the program online. And it was an incredible learning experience for me. And I made connections with people that I maintain to this day. And so what I really became immersed in at that point was not just the technology, but this notion of building community and the power of bringing people together face to face and um, getting them to get to know each other, have food together, talk, work on projects together, and then move online. And so that became my stock and trade. And I, um, I, after I graduated from that program, I was invited back because about halfway through the program, the World Wide Web was invented. And we needed to figure out some way to, to figure out what the web was going to do. And myself and another student were really interested in building, figuring out how to make web pages show up hmm. online. And so we started playing with HTML. And so I was hired after I graduated to come back and teach the first internet courses for teachers to make web pages. Um, and I stayed at, I stayed there and, and eventually moved to, for my day job, I moved to a big high school in downtown Albuquerque and I was the network administrator and staff developer and everything else related to technology um, for a high school for about seven years. And at the end of that time, I finished my doctorate and took a job at Sacramento State University working in a program called IMET, 
which was the internet-based masters in educational technology. And that was another cohort program that met 20% of the time face-to-face and 80% online, had a great experience there. And then in 2009, I was hired by Northern Illinois University uh, College of Education to move a master's program online here. And um, it's just completed, um, I want to say it's fifth year. And last year was ranked number one in the nation by U.S. News and World Report for online graduate education programs. And that, and that ranking has a lot to do with, with the quality of relationship that people have because of that hybrid sense of the, the hybrid design, which allows a sense of connection and community. And that leads me into social network analysis. Excellent. Because when I was a, um, when I was a school teacher, a first grade teacher and a fourth grade teacher and a high school teacher, I was, I was very much into um, the social domain for the kids. I, I, wanted, I wanted the kids to have a safe place to go to school. I wanted them to have friends. I wanted them to uh, learn collaboratively. And as the teacher, I could sit back in the room and I could look and I could see who was central to activity. I could see who people sought out for advice. I could see who was isolated. And based upon what I saw, I could make adjustments. I could work on things to make the room a more balanced place for everybody. Um, And one of the things that happened was that when I moved online, I realized I'd lost some of that capacity. When I'm working with, you know, 24 students online, I didn't have that capacity to just stand back and visually watch and be kind of a fly on the wall with the activity. And so I I had a pretty good sense, but I was looking for some method to um, capture relationships of students in in online groups. And that led me to um, just conversations with people, with colleagues that eventually led me to uh, looking into social network analysis. Excellent. So which leads us really to our first question. I mean, it's okay. pretty, it's a straightforward one, but it's one that definitely uh, people are interested in. What is social network analysis? Um, I'm actually going to bring up a PowerPoint, uh, some slides to show you because part of the power, a great deal of the power of social network analysis is that it is um, very powerful visually. And so what I'd like to do is bring up a, a presentation here. Uh, excellent. Yeah, and I uh, just for those uh, watching this, I'll have this actual PowerPoint presentation available on my website as well. So what you have in social network analysis is a way to measure and and um, describe the structure of a group of people who are interacting. Um, and yep. John, I no, don't want to interrupt you, but it didn't go up. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me make sure I'm sharing with you. And let's try this. How about now? Perfect. Beautiful. Yeah. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, So what happened was that social network analysis goes back years. There were people, uh, there's uh, Moreno in the 1930s studied playground behavior and drew dots that represented kids and drew lines um, that represented who their friends were and things like that. So the, the notion of drawing these network maps is a fairly old notion. Um, more recently, what happened was that um, mathematics came into play, and there were researchers, particularly at Harvard University, that began to apply graph theory and began to understand that there were structures, there were algorithms that could be applied that could really um, show the true structure of networks and allow people to predict behaviors and things in networks. Um, I don't tend to get very far into um, one of the things I want to tell the listeners is that, you know, not to be intimidated, not to be intimidated by any of it. I mean, there are things about social, the the math of social network analysis that are very difficult and very complex, 
but I found it very simple to engage with initially. So it's one of those areas that you can get into um, very easily, and then it goes to infinite levels of complexity. And so it's not difficult to do basic problem solving um, with social network analysis. What you're looking at on the screen here are is a simple little social network diagram that has a number of features. And what you see mainly are squares, um, and these can be dots. You know, those are things that you set up in the program how you want it to look. But essentially, dots represent individuals, and the lines represent the connections between individuals. And you'll note that the lines actually will have arrowheads at one side or the other. And what that indicates is that in, in this particular case, um, in the top right-hand corner, there's a node, and there's a line going from that node over to the node um, to the left. And in this case, that the person in the top left, represented by this node, did a survey where they said they have some connection with that person to their left. Um, in this case, that connection was not reciprocated. So in other words, um, person A chose person B, but person B did not cho choose person A. So that's why you have a line with a single arrowhead. How this works is that um, really a very simple surveys go out and the, the based upon the questions you ask and how they're structured in the survey, um, you'll get certain kinds of networks. And, and a very common one um, would be um, like a collaboration network. And so in my example here, um, it can say, uh, a, a question might say, check the names of anyone on the list below with whom you have collaborated on a work-related project. And then what you have is a roster list of everybody that's in the organization. And in my example, I have Mary and Ted and Bill and Jane, okay? And so Mary and Ted and Bill and Jane all fill out this survey, and they just put a check mark next to the person that they've interacted with. Once, and once that's done and the researcher gets the surveys back, those are put into a very simple matrix, a very simple spreadsheet that just shows um, – ones and zeros with ones meaning somebody was checked so a, a one means the presence of a connection and a zero means there was not a connection present okay and so you, from the paper survey you go back you make your matrix and then um, the program that I use is called UCINet there are a number of programs out there um, I use UCINet because it's good for the scale of projects that I do it's very reasonably priced, but there are, um, you know, as with all things technology, there are new programs being born every day. But what you're looking at here is a UCINet uh, matrix. And then UCINet has, within UCINet, there's a program called NetDraw. And NetDraw takes the matrices and you pull the matrices up in NetDraw and it draws the diagrams for you. So what you have on this screen is the paper survey question the matrix that resulted from that survey, and then down on the bottom left, you've got the visual rendering of the network. And you can see that Mary and Jane are connected to each other. They selected each other as a collaborative contact. Bill chose Mary. Mary didn't choose Bill. That's, that's a very basic how it works kind of a thing. Um, is that clear, Tim? Do you have any questions about that? No, that's, that, that's okay. clear. Okay. The second thing that's very interesting to do is that in addition to the nodes and the connections, you can begin to bring in attributes. And attributes are just characteristics. So they could be, uh, it could be sex, age, um, years on the job, um, number of publications if you're in academia. And um, then, you, and so the, the matrices can be represented with the nodes representing the people, the lines representing the connections, and colors, shapes, sizes, things like that representing different characteristics. So if I wanted to see, in this case, I wanted to, I wanted to look at these relationships by gender. And we can see here that Mary and Jane showed up in red, uh, and the, uh, Bill and Ted showed up as blue, and that represents male versus female. If you wanted to look at that for some reason, it's just that's just an example of an attribute. 
Um, I wanted to talk about very quickly a, a, a couple of real world examples. I got into social network analysis because, as I mentioned, I wanted to get a sense of how my students were connecting online. And right about the time that I was looking into it, I was at a holiday celebration with my brother, who is a professor um, in New Orleans, Louisiana. And after Katrina, after Hurricane Katrina hit, he was put on loan to the city of New Orleans to just try to help the mayor um, better the city of New Orleans. And as you can imagine, when that hurricane hit, it was it was a historical event where the infrastructure of a giant city was destroyed. Schools, buses, police, it was all gone. And there were groups of people that were working very hard to fill that void with positive things instead of instead of negative things. And he started an organization and we were just going for a walk. And he was saying, you know, what I really need is the it was coming up on the fifth year anniversary of the storm and the people that were providing funding to his organization wanted him to come to Minneapolis to this think tank and do a and do a presentation that showed them how um, effective his organization was at bringing people together and connecting people together and that gave me the motivation to help him gave me the motivation to get over the hump in terms of learning some of the basic social network analysis stuff. And so what we did was um, we put out a survey to everybody in his organization that asked the question, who did you work with for the betterment of the city of New Orleans before Katrina? And who have you worked with since the storm for the betterment of the city of New Orleans? And what you're looking at here is one of the results. And so you can see here that pre-Katrina, um, on the left, you can see that was the network of interactions between people. And on the right, you can see the interactions after the storm. And these are, there are statistical measures for each one of these, so, so we can describe all these things. But essentially, it's very powerful visually. If you look and see that prior to Katrina, you had an interesting network that was pretty weak in terms of people working together for the betterment of the city, including a huge uh, subgroup of what we call isolates, which are people that are not connected to anybody. Okay, So these people, the dots that you see on the upper left-hand corner of this pre-Katrina diagram, these are people that are supposed to be collaborating and working for the betterment of the city, and they did not identify anybody that they were working with. And, and John, this was an... Or this, the pre and the post, this shows the organization your brother was working in at the time? He founded this organization. Okay. And so this was done in retrospect. Okay. okay. So he was not around during the pre. Right in the middle, the storm hit. And then after the storm, he founded this organization. And so what people wanted to know was, you know, show me that you've got people connecting in a way they weren't connecting before. And so this is one just subgroup. I have about 17 different slides that I'd be happy to share with you if you if you want to see them. These I just picked because they were easily representable online because this is this is the civic group. We also had religious groups, we had business groups, we had education groups. And then I have then I have maps of the entire structure, but they're so complex that they'd never show up on the screen. So I just wanted to show an example. And um, there are some interesting things here. There's an interesting structure on the bottom left here. You can see this is something that we call a clique. And I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Maybe you can get the slides from Tim after the presentation, but it's an example of what they call a maximally complete subgroup. So it's a small network within a larger network. Hmm. But what's interesting here is that it's a pendant by nature in that if one person disappears, then you'll get another group of three isolates. And so one of the things that's interesting to me about social network analysis is that um, it came very intuitively to me because I was, a, I was a hack network administrator at my high school. Okay, I was a school teacher, but if I wanted a jo the job, I had to do the network too. <coughs> and when I look at networks, it works the same way a computer network was. Okay, and so if you have a situation where if if these if you imagine these squares as a computer server if this one server goes down these people are off the network 
Okay, and so if you're if you're if you're looking at networks, what you want to do is you want to build in redundancies. And so if I want to go if I want to strengthen this network, one thing I would do is I would go see about connecting these people that are only connected to one person who's connected to the network and get them their own connections to other places in the network. So if this person retires or resigns or goes away for some reason, it doesn't disintegrate that portion of my network. A second study that I did was actually on the IMET program, and what we were after here was um, we we applied a model by Wenger of the Lave and Wenger, who were the original community of practice people. They wrote the book Situated Learning, and um, what Lave and Wenger talk about is the fact that when you bring people together, at first the leaders are very central to the community. And so the community is really relying upon the leaders and the people that are in the group are really participating what they call peripheral, uh, peripherally. So they, that's where the term legitimate peripheral participation came from. And so what you're looking at here is a slide that shows the network during the program on the left with the program leaders and on the right you see a uh, picture without the program leaders. And so you can see that the network really turn, and the colors here represent different cohorts. And so, you know, the black is one cohort, the green is another cohort, the pink is another cohort. And you can see that if you pull the leadership out of the network during the program, it becomes a network of networks. It becomes a network where the people in group five know all the other people in group five, but there's not a, there's not a lot of cross-pollination going on. Um, what was really interesting is beyond that, and I don't think I included that. Oh, yes, I did. Um, what was very cool in terms of the study was that afterward, if you show the program with the leaders and the program without the leaders, the network is still largely intact. And that's also something that would be predicted by communities of practice because what happens is that the people that were participating peripherally start to move into the center. The other interesting thing is that we found, in ter because of the social network analysis, is that if you look at the picture, the diagram on the right, you see over on the right-hand side that the yellow and the brown and the pink color groups are still really tightly um, clustered to each other. It's, it's, it's called homophily in, in social network analysis. It's an example of, you know, they're in group four, so they're going to hang out with group four people. Um, where over on the left it's more distributed and what's interesting is that this is a function of time. So the people over on the left hand side of the diagram have been out of the program the longest. So what happens is people stay tight in their community but then after the community they go out and they find each other out in the community and they have that bond from being in the community and so over time what you'll get is a fully functioning network that's connected with all of these people with the complete absence of the original leaders. Which is something that which is something that you really want to see. So it was a way of using social network analysis to validate the fact that communities of practice were worth the investment in bringing people together. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. The last example is something I'm doing right now. Hold on, just a second. My in my new position, what I'm doing is I'm responsible as a member of a team of people to establish a campus-wide standard for online quality for our online courses. And so um, we pulled together some key stakeholders and ran them through a training on something called Quality Matters, which is just a, it's a national body that's trying to pull together standards for quality online coursework. And um, after the coursework, after they went through their day of coursework, I did a survey with them and I asked them um, a number of different questions and what you see here is the representation of our initial work after session one. So these people, um, this diagram represents stakeholders from all over the campus and the locate, their location is, is a shape. Okay, so if they're in a department, um, like the, the green is a certain, like green might be faculty development, red might be the College of Engineering. Um, the size 
uh, their role in the institution is designated by a number. So if they're a dean, they're one number. If they're a, if they're a faculty developer, they're another number. Their expertise is the size, and their and their interest in helping us with this project is represented by color. So what I have here is a network, and if you and if the if the if the node is green, that means that they are on board with us and they're ready to move forward with us. If it's yellow, they're hesitant, they have more questions or they're not quite sure. And if they're red, um, they're not interested for some reason or another. And it, that's and one thing about the network analysis is it just is what it is. So you can't, I, I can't apply, I can't apply a, an overt amount of meaning to like I have a giant red dot there that's got a lot of people connected to them who are not interested in proceeding. What I would do with this information is use it to go talk to that person and find out why they're a big red dot. You know, they're, you're you're a big dot on my map, <laughs> and it would be great for me if you would turn green because everybody cares about what you think because you can see there's a ton of uh, arrows coming in at that guy. And so as I move, and so what I've done with this information is, is I've taken it back to the team, and I've said, okay, here are the results, and um, based upon this, you know, let's have a discussion. And then what happens is, the social network analysts call it a social. They call it an ethnographic sandwich. You have to go in, get to know people, do your survey. You have to do the social network analysis. That's the meat. And then the other bun is going back afterward and saying, this is what I came up with. Can you help me make sense of this? Hey, so John, can I ask a question about sure. how you arrived at how you arrived at this? Did you do, like you showed in a previous slide, that a type of surveys? That... That's what it was. Yeah, they did a, they did a paper survey. Okay. And um, there were, I had... Um, I think there were six, five or six different ways they could choose to be involved in the process moving forward. And what you do is you establish the context. There, there are a lot of things that you have to establish and you just have to explain when you're doing the analysis. One thing is the boundary of the community. You know, like if you're doing a particular study, how do, how do you cut it off at a certain point? You just have to explain those things. What I did was if everybody, if somebody showed an interest in one thing or the other, they were green. If somebody showed hesitation in one way or another, they were yellow. And if somebody, and if they were, and if there were no green or no yellow, if, if, it, if it was all no, or I need more questions, or if it, it, it was, um, they, they would be your red. And, and, that, and that would mean just the, what this really indicates is areas for concern. You know, and so we have we have people that are ready to roll forward with us. We have people that are on the fence, and we have people that we've got some work to do to get them on board. Based upon this, and then the connections part of that was done by people. How, how did you go about the connections part? What the the connections was a very typical social network analysis. It was just a roster list that asked them. Um, I did three different things. You're looking at one network here. This is a worked with in the past. I did a who have you worked with. I also did who would you seek advice from, because that's another pretty typical social network analysis thing to show power of people in a network. And so this is who have you worked with. And so if you look at the ones in the center, um, the large figures in the center, um, those tended to be uh, people in our faculty development departments and our e-learning departments who do a lot of service with people helping them do things. But then it's also, but then there are also other interesting things. Like if you look over on the right hand side of the diagram, there are people there with a lot of incoming connections with no experience. And so they have some other kind of influence. Okay, because some of the questions, the 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 size the expertise is size and the expertise is an attribute and the and the attribute of size on the survey was I have no experience teaching online I have zero to two te uh, I have one to two years I have three to five years I have five plus ten plus etc and so another interesting thing about this network is we have some people with no experience who have a lot of influence and right now they're red so even though they don't have a lot of expertise teaching online. Um, they're not, there's going to be a lot of people listening to them 
<laughs> is what this looks like. So we, and, and again, you don't you don't want to over rely on just this one measure. You want to take it and use it to get more information. It helps you ask the next next set of questions. Sure. Cool. And I and um, I think that's about it. I'm going to put this up on the slide. Uh, the last slide here. There is a. Um, uh, Hanneman uh, wrote a textbook. Hanneman and Riddle wrote an ebook on social network analysis. It's really good. It's really great, and um, uses the UCI Net program that I that I talked about using. And um, it's available for free at this link. So you can go get the whole book, and it talks about nodes, and it goes from very simple to very complex. Really wonderful ebook that they just put out there for anybody to have. Yeah, that's cool. Excellent. Yeah, and I. Again, I'll share uh, John's slides, and I'll also put the link to that directly into that. Cool. That's thanks for that's a great explanation of social network. I'm sure you could talk, you could probably talk for days on that. But that was a great overview, great overview, and and I like the examples that you gave. You made it real with uh, the work that you've done. Thank you. So I, I have a couple more questions. So uh, if you were to, you know. Talk about the importance of social network, and you've kind of talked about this already. I mean, you, you have, but I just kind of want to go back to it. Uh, you know, and don't mean to be crass about it, but why should we care? If we're an instructional designer or we're an educator, you know, we're in the field of educational technology, why, why should we care about social network analysis? Well, I think the, um, I think the real answer to that, in my mind, um, is that well, there's, I, I, have, I have a personal response and a professional response to that. It, just intuitively, um, I feel, and I think one supports the other, but I feel like we're at a phase where if you, if you look at things like singularity, if you look at things like the rate of innovation um, accelerating in this part of the century, um, I think the real hope that we have for positive outcomes is our connectedness to other people. So I think relationships matter a lot. I think I think who you know is 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 extremely important. And I think that understanding whether or not people that you're working with, like your students, if you've got a group of online students, um, and uh, you know, if what good teacher would want to have a student feeling isolated in a group? You know, I I, I think it just I think I think how people are connected is going to be a really important thing and who they're connected to is going to be absolutely critical as we move forward and I think the work that I've done, the research work that I've done so far has borne out the fact that any investment that I have ever convinced a program to make in face-to-face -face time bringing people together to get to know each other has always uh, been well worth it. It's always been, It's always been worth the time and money spent to make that happen What's interesting about that, though, is that that's counterintuitive to people coming in. So, for instance, in the IMET program, um, I left there. Uh, IMET 12 was my last group. I think they're still running, and they're on like IMET 18 or 19 now. But um, almost to a person, when we did a survey, we, we had a three-day orientation at the beginning of the program, and we did a survey of people and and asked them to write reflectively as well about their experience of the orientation. And going into the orientation, they really complained a lot about having to make face-to-face -face time. I signed up to be online. Why do I have to be here face-to-face? -face? And so um, almost to a person, they really complained about having to make time to show up face-to-face. Those very same people at the end of the program when they're doing their exit narrative cite the fact that they came together and got to know people as the most important thing about the program. So it can be tough when you're getting started because people don't know what they don't know because we're not doing a very good job of helping people relate to each other right now. And I think that's, there are a lot of answers there. And so it's important that people are connected. And so if it's important that people are connected, it's important to have statistical measures to look at and improve networks. You know, you wouldn't just throw a bunch of computers out there in a network and, and not know that you had redundancies or not checking different weaknesses in the networks and the, and the same holds true for people. Yeah, cool. So I like to end with a question about advice and 
uh, you know, what, so let's, re- related to sh- social network analysis, and, and again, I think you've, you've, you've touched on this and throughout, but just want to end with this question. What advice do you have for educators, instructional designers, again, educational technologists about social, social network analysis? Um, I think you just mentioned one of them. If you have connection, I mean, if you have people coming together, you want to know the connections. Mm-hmm. Uh, so understanding that, but any other advice maybe about how to get started or anything that comes to your mind? Yeah, I think there, there's a couple of things. And, and, and one thing, and this, and this is almost funny because it, it seems logical if you think about it, but people who are into social network analysis are into how people are connected. And anytime I've been around people who are doing this kind of work, they tend to be pretty cool people. <laughs> they're relational, right? And so they're easy to sit down and have a cup of coffee with. And so I went as I went as a as as basically a nobody in the field to the international social network analysis uh, convention, and was brought into little networks of different things and invited to go to things. And and um, and so it's 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 a relational group of people that I've run into so far. Um, there is a group. Uh, there, there's a department at the University of Kentucky in the Gatton School of Economics where they, ha- they have an entire sub-department on, that are social network analysts. And they run a camp that you can go to um, every summer. And so I went there. Uh, I did that camp. I did, the, I did the beginner track twice at that camp because for me, um, me learning some technologies is like, throwing mud at a wall you know you just got to keep throwing until enough sticks to where you've got some substance and so I did the beginner track twice there the first time was really getting to know it the second time I had my data from New Orleans and so I actually had a data set to work with so that would lead me to a next point if you have some data that's meaningful to you it'll help you push you over the top in terms of there's some humps that you hit in terms of things you have to figure out but um, I'd say the biggest thing is is it's really an accessible thing um, you can you, you can sit down and figure this stuff out and there are people that write articles in the International Social Network Analysis Journal that I, I really don't understand you know what they're at what they're after because of the level that they're at and the level that they're dealing with I'm not a mathematician I'm an educator that that that, is, that cares about society and relationships and I found this to be something that I can use to solve really critical problems and really help develop programs and so I would not I would not let uh, you know the the any any fears you might have about becoming involved with it I would just try to put those aside and give it a try and if anybody uh, Tim, you can put my email out, and if anybody has questions, you know, I'm I'm, I'm happy to uh, uh, send people to connect people to my social networks about social networks. Excellent, thanks. Appreciate that. Well, John, again, I want to thank you for your time and for talking about social network analysis in your work. I know it's it, it's helped me, and uh, great. And I'm sure it'll help uh, my students and other people who watch us. So, again, thank you for. Uh, giving up your time. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Tim. I like talking about it. It's fun. It is.